Is there anyone who needs a pen or a pen? I'll just have one. If not, we do have to do the last. We will need that for part of this presentation. David George Brooke, that gratitude guy, has been a speaker, teacher, life coach, and best-selling author for over 25 years. He is a former Nordstrom store manager and has managed in the corporate world for over 30 years. His published works include The Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, Happiness Starts with Gratitude, and a number of other books on gratitude. He recently shared the stage with Bill Gates Sr. at a regional conference and is currently conducting keynotes and workshops for Special Olympics, Children's Hospital, ESHS, and our U.S. military community. As a result of his passion for gratitude, he has presented over 250 speeches and workshops in the past three years. With over 650 gratitude videos from the time you do, thousands have gained his message, and he is now considered a leading authority on gratitude and on living the life of gratitude in the Thank you. thank you, Major Bento. I would like to also thank Captain Don Marie Williams and a number of other people who have been very helpful in getting me down to this base and spreading a message which I'm very passionate about. By show of hands, how many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? Half, two-thirds. I'm fortunate enough to do talks from high schools where I do commencement speeches up to nursing homes where their probably average age is 90, 95, and then the high schools at 17, 18 years old. Nursing homes, everybody raises their hand. High schools, at least half the people raise their hand. And it tells me that so many people are looking for something to help them when they're going through a tough time. I'd like to tell you briefly about my significant personal loss. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I woke up and looked to my right. My wife was not in bed. I thought, something's right. that's something strange. Just then, my four-year-old, Connor, comes in. Where's mommy? I don't know. My 14-year-old, Kyle, comes in. Same question. We have no idea where Dana is. So we walk out down the hallway, and we look in a couple of rooms, and we look downstairs, and down in front of the washer and dryer, here's Dana, all crumpled over. It didn't look good. I run down there. Connor's crying. What's wrong with mommy? I turn her over. There's stuff coming out of her mouth. Kyle, I said, Kyle, go call the uh, fire, call the medics, call the police, call everybody. And within a matter of maybe five or six minutes, I was doing chest compressions and mouth to mouth, working on her. They all came in, and there probably was 20 or 25 people in our house in, as I say, six to eight minutes. So the, for those of you that have gone through something like this, one of the things that you may or probably always will remember is time has no measure. And I'm watching her work on her with those paddles and all those tubes and everything. They've got her all spread out on the floor and all these wires and things, these connections. A little short fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brook, we've been working on your wife for 90 minutes. We still don't have a heartbeat. Would you like us to continue? So again, for those of you that have been through something like this, this little CPU up here, our brain, goes into shock and has a different way of looking at things, but it still computes a little bit. And I thought, 90 minutes, no heartbeat. And looked at her and I said, um, no, you can stop. And she was dead. And she was 38 years old. She had died of a prescription pill overdose. Vicodin, Oxycontin, all those nasty things. But what made it so challenging for me, that was not the first significant personal loss I had suffered in my life. I had so many things that happened to me, and this was 1998, as I mentioned. My father had committed suicide, and my mother had died of cancer. Two of my best friends died the night we graduated from high school in a really horrible car accident. Friends in Vietnam. It just went on and on and on. And I realized at some point, I am going to need some sort of tool or tools in this life toolkit, if you will, that are going to help me. And it wasn't until a little later I discovered gratitude. But I will say something first. A lot of it depends on how you look at something. I walked up to the deck we had two or three days after Dana passed away and I pinched my skin and I went, I'm just another little person, another human being just trying to get through life. 
And for the first time in my life, I understood why people kill themselves. I never thought about it up really till that point. We lived about a mile from the Aurora Bridge. Pretty simple. All I have to do is walk over to the Aurora Bridge, jump off, everything's done. So I sat there for about five minutes all by myself and I thought about it. Well, that's great, Dave. Connor and Kyle don't have a mother, so now you're going to have them not have a dad. And I kind of looked up at the sky and I thought, you know what, I'm not going to do that. And once you make a decision not to do something, it's kind of off the checklist. And I haven't thought about that since because I decided it wasn't going to be a choice. I decided to raise those two kids. But I will say this, a lot of it depends on how you look at something. I'd like everybody to stand up if you would be so kind. And what I'd like you to do is raise your right hand and start circling it in a clockwise manner. Now you can only imagine in the high schools they have no idea what clockwise is. So I have to, I have to go like this and show them and they go, I'm digital. So you can stretch it up higher. That's right. It's good for you this time in the morning. Okay, now keep it going clockwise. Now just start slowly bringing it down. Down to your eyes, down to your chin, down to your chest, down to your waist. Now what direction is it going? First row? Bueller? Who said counterclockwise? Good job. Counterclockwise. Okay, you can sit down. See, there's always, this is my favorite part of this, there's always a couple of people going like this, like, what just happened? Well, we don't have glasses of water. I could say the glass is half full or half empty. I have these fraternity brothers I've known for 45 years, and one of them sees me about six months ago, and he goes, you know, I've seen your little presentation. Frankly, I wasn't that impressed. He says, so, but how does this work? Well, if you're so, like, not impressed, why would you have to ask me that? Because you're looking at it above, it's clockwise. Below, it's counterclockwise. But again, it depends on how you look at it. Looking at something from a positive or a negative manner is a choice. You can tell me you're the most negative person you, I've ever met or positive. It doesn't matter. It's your choice. Happiness is a choice. Is a choice. Gratitude is a choice. But one of the things I liked about gratitude, what embracing gratitude does is help you to focus on what you have and not what you don't have. So now those little 3 by 5 cards you have, grab that card and you're going to need a partner. This is a two-person exercise. So if you have to move, so there's two of you, pick a partner, get a pen out. So one of you guys is going to have to move here because you've got five people there. Because you've got to have two people. And does everybody have a 3 by 5 card and a pen? Okay, what are you guys doing? Is who's who's going to... No, you got to do two. You want to do with me? You want to do with me? Sure. Okay, I got to get a card. I got to get a card. Can you do me a favor and grab another card for me then? Okay, everybody got a partner? Two, four, six. Okay, cool. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to do, I'm going to work with this gentleman here so we, everybody has, this is not a three-person exercise. Now, what are you guys doing? Who's, who's the, who are, who's patching up? How about you guys? And then who are you doing it with? Can you go do with this gentleman? Thanks. Thank you. And here, Major Vento has got a couple other cards. Now here's what I'd like you to do. I'll give you a little time. For those of you that have your cards, have your partner. Upper left-hand corner of that card. Thank you, sir. I want you to write these four words. I see you as. I C S E E you as. Upper left-hand corner. I see you as. Upper right hand corner, write your partner's name. You have a partner? Okay, good. good. And lastly, for you speedy ones, lower right hand corner, sign your name. Now here's what, is everybody, got, everybody ready to roll? Hands up if you're not. I see you as the partner's name and then your name in the lower right hand corner. Good. I'm going to give you 60 seconds and here's what I'd like you to do. Whether you know that person or not, I want you to write how you see them. I see you as energetic. I see you as excited. I see you as happy. As I see you as intelligent. Whatever you think you see in that person, write that as fast as you can. I'll give you 60 seconds. Go.
About 20 seconds left. You say counterclockwise? That is. It's for you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You bet. Okay, and stop. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. I'll give you another 60 seconds. Take 30 seconds each and read to the other person what you wrote about them. Go. Okay, and stop. Now I would like you to hand the card to the other person so you have the card that was written about you. And even though they just read what they wrote to you, I would like you to just silently reread what they said about you. That's how somebody else sees you. And as you look at what that person wrote about you, whether they knew you or not, just look into that card. How many people, by show of hands, just might hold on to that card? Thanks. It's been great being here today. You guys are... That is how somebody else sees you. That is a two-minute exercise of what embracing gratitude will do for you. When I think about the ways I've talked to myself in my life, some of the words I've used, one of the words I don't use anymore is L-O-S-E-R. I don't understand why we say stuff to ourselves we'd never say to a friend. I was going to do it with this young man over here, don't even know him, and it's amazing how often you look at the car and somebody doesn't even know you has met you two seconds ago can nail you. Energetic, happy, enthusiastic, fit, whatever it might be that they say about you. Now I will tell you, being young men and women as you are, I give you guys credit because I tried this in the high schools and it doesn't work very well. Because the guy shows me his card and he goes, I see you as an idiot. You're missing the point. Gosh. See that gentleman, what's your first name? Mike. What is it? Mike. Sir. Mike, great smile. First thing I noticed when I walked up to him. All those types of things. And that's what, that's what gratitude... <laughs> He's going to be doing a special presentation in about five minutes. That's what gratitude will do for you. So I'm going to talk about five things today. Embracing gratitude is what we just talked about. It takes as long as it takes. Never give up. Never, ever, ever, ever give up was Winston Churchill. It takes as long as it takes. I'm 65 years old. You heard Major Vento introduce me. I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19. I went out and managed Nordstrom stores and Lowe's, did all these other things. Had all this bad stuff happen to me. And it wasn't until two or three years ago I decided, I think you better start paying attention. You said you were going to be a speaker when you were 19. So when I first won, I didn't know what it was going to do. I didn't know if it was going to be gratitude. I just knew it was going to be something with motivation because it's fun to get people enthusiastic because there's a lot of negative downing people around. And it's fun to make a difference. Even if it's one person today looks at something differently, to me, it's worthwhile. So I quit Lowe's December 27th, 2012. Connor was 17. He was four when Dana passed away. I come home. It's about two in the afternoon. And he goes, what are you doing home? And I said, well, I quit Lowe's. You quit Lowe's? And I went, yeah, he goes, what do you do? I said, I'm going to be a speaker. And he's 17 on the couch. He looks up at me and he goes, well, that's just super dad. I have a question. What are we going to do for food? I said, Connor, just, just trust your dad. I'm telling you, you've got to find your passion at some point. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But you just can't give up. Connor himself found out what it was like to be told he was worthless. 
When he was four, Dana, was, that's how old he was when Dana died, I had to put him through all this special education, and they had these individual education programs, all these different things. And the person that was taking his diagnostic assessment says, your son is messed up. I said, his mom just died six months ago. I understand that, but he's messed up. He's going to have a hard time in life. So he did. I had to run him through kindergarten twice, first grade, first grade twice. It was ridiculous. Tough, tough, tough. Then he wanted to play sports. So he plays baseball. That was dad's only one I want to play is baseball. But he couldn't play. Couldn't hit, couldn't run, couldn't throw, couldn't catch. Other than that, decent skills. True story. So we get him out there playing T ball. The ball is right here on the T. And Connor's swinging up. What are you doing swinging? He's looking at me, swinging up here. I go, Connor, the ball's down here. So he finally keeps getting lower and lower. The lower, Connor, and I'm not the coach, I'm just the parent. He finally hits the tee, the ball dribbles forward, and he goes, Dad, I got a hit. I don't think that's how the game is played, Connor. But he kept trying. He just refused to give up, but he never played. To this day, it's still a tough story for me to relate. He never stopped. He went on and on. Finally, we get to be May 12th, 2005. He's 11 years old. And they're in a game, and there's a guy at second and third, seventh, bottom of the seventh, two out. I think the coach is out of players. So he looks down to the dugout. He goes, is there anybody left? And somebody says, Brooks out there. So Connor comes out, swinging a bat like he's Babe Ruth. He's never had a hit in his life. And then he does something to just shock the heck out of me. He looks up at the stands, Dad, I'm up! Now, for those of you that have gone to Little League games, the kids want the parents there, but they do not want to acknowledge them. So I knew that was the first, first problem. He gets up to bat. Ball one, strike one. Ball two, strike three. Or strike two. Full count. Next pitch comes in. Rips it down the third baseline. Just inside the bag. Goes into left field. The guy from third comes in to score. The guy from second rounds third comes to home. Here comes the ball. The guy, the catcher. They all come together. The catcher catches it. They crash at the plate. The ball pops out. They win the game eight to seven. He's sitting out there, way out in second base, like this. Dad, I got a hit! <laughs> the entire dugout comes over and takes him on their shoulders off the field. I used to not even be able to tell that story, because it's so tough for those of you that have ever been parents, or maybe someday will be, will get it. It's a tough, tough thing to go through stuff yourself. It's even tougher when you watch your kids go through it. But I sat him down on the bed that night, and I said, you know what, Connor? Now that your dad is Mr. Speaker, it was going to be Mr. Speaker, you can't give up. And they said it was never about baseball. It was about the fact that you never gave up, and he didn't. And he went on, this is a small picture, it's a big group, but he went on to finish at Bothell High School with a 3-5 average, student of the year, and maybe most importantly, leadoff hitter on the baseball team, hitting over 300. Thank you. You get a book right there. I'm going to tell you, thank you for doing that. Thank you, I appreciate that. He's down in San Diego going to school, and every once in a while he comes to see a talk, and I'll say, you want to meet Connor? And everybody else, and he stands up and turns beet red. But that's just one story of many, and that's the only one I'm going to share with you, but people that give up, and whether it's suicide or overdosing on pills or so many different things, it always gets better. It always got better for me. Was it today or tomorrow? Maybe not. Was it 10 minutes from now? Was it next week? Maybe. But it always got better. But if you have that attitude of it takes as long as it takes, and the reason I bring up, by the way, the fact I'm 65 years old, I'll be 66 in January, doesn't matter to me. This is my journey in life. Every one of you people has your own journey. You get to run your own race. Mary Kay Ash, 58 years old when she started Mary Kay. Colonel Sanders, 63 for Colonel Sanders' chicken. Ray Kroc and his mixers before he got McDonald's going, was in his mid-50s. So it doesn't matter. Now, you folks are all very young, but it doesn't matter what your journey is. There's going to be something out there for you that'll be that race that you get to run. But I'll tell you, when I tell those high schools, I talk to them about how, what would I have liked to have known when I was 18 that I now know that I'm 65. This is life. It's up and down, up and down. I've never met anybody that's all up or all down. Now, some would argue I've met some people that's all down, but some of that's their choice. But up here is really fun. Down here is not fun. Back here is where everybody wants to be when they're down in the dumps. But down here is where you learn the lessons. 
I'll tell you something else about being down there. You find out who your friends are. And sometimes that can be a really good message. So I just feel it's so important to have a vehicle that can help you, in this case, gratitude. Secondly, have an attitude of never giving up and it takes as long as it takes. And there's so many great... I remember John Lennon was eight years old. He's like the second or third grade. And they're going around the room. John Lennon, what do you want to be when you grow up? He looks at the teacher and he goes, happy. The teacher looks back at him and he goes, you don't understand the assignment. John Lennon looks back at the teacher, you don't understand life. Long before he wrote any songs with the Beatles. The concept is, it's about having a vehicle that can make such a difference. Robin Williams, I saw him a few times. He died about a year ago. Here's a person that on the surface had pretty much everything you would think. Funny, talented, successful, money, everything. I'm doing a talk, and I get a buzz. I use my cell phone a lot to time like those exercises and so forth. And I, I, and I feel it buzzing. I can't be checking text while I'm talking. And I check it when I'm timing somebody and it says, I wonder if Robin Williams would have made a difference if he had a gratitude journal. When we get to talking about a gratitude journal, a gratitude journal takes five minutes to write in. That's all it does. And all I offer it is, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it's a vehicle, it's a tool in a toolkit that can make such a difference. Third thing I like to talk about Make room for gratitude. You've got to get rid of junk in your brain. I go out to these, uh, used to live out in Bothell, I now live in Issaquah. And I see these three car garages, and I think they were supposed to have cars in them, was how those houses were designed. But you just see floor to ceiling boxes. And then you look at them, there's like a little space like this big. And then these little people are just sort of shuffling down to get their little box. And I think, do they really need all that stuff? I don't know. We collect a lot of stuff in our life. But when I get to do workshops, people will tell me, they'll say, well, you don't understand, Mr. Brook. You don't understand, David. I have an ex-wife, an ex-husband, and something like that. And I go, okay, so when did you get divorced? In 1998. Oh, so that's like 16 or 17 years ago, and it's still kind of an excuse. So it pays to get rid of junk. And one of the things that you'll notice is you get rid of junk, you can travel lighter, it's like less stuff in your backpack, and it makes a huge, huge, huge difference. I told somebody recently, they said, I want to change my life. They told me that, and I said, well, why don't you just change your life? And they looked at me like, that's kind of a silly thing to say. I said, not really. If you want to change your life, why don't you just change it? When you go out in those cars today, those windshields that in most of your cars are going to be about two feet deep, they're about five feet wide. And then you'll notice the rear view mirror is about this big. That's about 100 to 1 or 200 to 1 or something like that. I would suggest that you look at your life in about that proportion. Mostly look and pay attention to what's in front of you. And look in the rear mirror occasionally to learn a lesson. But mostly look in front of you. If you see flashing blue lights, as I did about an hour and a half ago on Federal Way, true story. I'm actually on my way kind of a little late to be down to the joint base. Didn't give me a ticket. You may have to pull over. But mostly that's a pretty good philosophy to really pay attention to what's in front of you and learn from what's behind you and not worry about it too much. When I got to manage those low stores and Nordstrom stores, a lot of employees, four to five hundred employees, a lot of different people, there's a lot of different personalities and individuals here. And I always talked about the fact that I'm always looking for that one person out of 20. That's 5%. 1 in 20. I'd ask people, are you the 1 or are you one of the 19? They'd always raise their hands. And I'll tell you where I noticed that really got me, is when Dana had passed away, she was 38 years old. Before she passed away, she was arrested for prescription fraud. We met at Nordstrom. She was very tall, very pretty, blonde. Our first date was running Green Lake. She could run faster than I could, and I was a decent runner. And she was in detox three different times before that day when she died. This doctor calls me, and Dr. Dickinson. Are you David Brooke? Uh-huh. See all those people over there? They're all addicted to something. I know. I said, I, I, I'm just mostly concerned about the blonde gal there. That's my wife. He goes, I know. I want to tell you what you're up against. Probably one of the biggest reasons why I'm doing this today. One of the biggest reasons. 
All those people over there? He says, one in 20. Let me repeat that. One in 20, he says to me, will make it back to a normal life. And of the 19 that don't, half of them will be dead in six months. And Dana was dead about six months later. As I mentioned, she was 38. I would not have believed it. I would not have believed it. So I started noticing when I was managing employees and different people, how many people, for every 20 people I had, how many people were really phenomenal employees. And it was always about one. Back to 5%. It was kind of the same odds Dr. Dickinson had said to me. So I had this, this gal named Tracy. She says, I want you to know I'm going to be the one. And she was working for me. And the next thing you know, she tells me she's pregnant with some guy from another department and she has to leave town. And she says, well, I'll, I, I will be the one. I'll be the one that's going to be, you're going to see. I'm going to keep in touch with you, but I'm going to move to Texas. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have my baby. So she moves to Texas. I get a call about a year later. Kind of frankly I'd forgotten about her. Mr. Brooke, it's Tracy. I just want you to know I'm the one. I told you I was going to be the star. You're going to be proud of me. And I actually kind of forgotten about her. She said, I had my baby. I said, great. What's his name? His name was Richie. So she tells me about that. And then she says, I completely changed my life. Not only Richie, new job. I got a new man in my life. Everything is going great. You told me, you said, change your life. And I changed my life. I said, you got a new man in life? And she goes, yeah. I go, what's his name? Robert. What's Robert do? Well, he's on work release right now. It was so hard to take that phone call. I said, well, that's good, Tracy. I hope things work out for you. I don't know if that's exactly changing your life, but good for you for taking a step forward. That's why I look at things like gratitude and things that are actually good, great tools that you can use. So by show of hands, how many people here have heard of a gratitude journal? A few? Depends on the group that I go to. As I said, I speak from groups from very young to quite a bit significantly older. Well, I had never heard of a gratitude journal. My buddy says to me, you know, you're a mess. I said, thanks, Bob. I really appreciate that. My wife died and a lot of other stuff has happened. He goes, well, you ought to get a gratitude journal. So I got one and I started writing in it. And I started to notice a difference. And I ended up making my own. First one I got was like from Amazon or what have you. Very simple. It's just a journal that you write in every day. You spend five minutes, as I mentioned. There's a little saying at the top. It says if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. If you write about it, it empowers you. So when I get those average ages where more your age or maybe the high schools, I show people this and I always get this in the audience. Uh, do you have an app? Is there, is there like an app? And actually I do. I can press a button on Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. I am so grateful to Major Vento, Captain Don Marie Williams, a number of other people for inviting me down here. So it'll type it, and it'll print it, and you hit it, and it just stays right there for that day. It's not the same, though. They've done studies now that even with these keyboards, it connects to your brain, but there's nothing like writing. It starts with a thought in your brain and back up to this brain, the CPU here. Your arm, your hand, the pen, the paper, I am so grateful for this, makes a huge, huge difference. So those three by five cards you have, I'd like you to pull that card out. That's the one that the person wrote about you. Hopefully you all have that, and I'd like you to turn it over. Now this exercise is for you and you only. There's no partners, there's no sharing, there's nothing like that. But here's what I want you to think about. Every once I see kids, especially how they're giggling, I go, what are you guys giggling about? You're not, you're not supposed to be talking to each other. This is your exercise. So, first thing I want you to think about is the number one to ten. This very moment, let's see what time it is, I think it's 10.30 or something. This very moment, 10.30 on September 17th, I want you to think about what number you are right now to assess your whole life. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial relationships, whatever it is. If you had to give yourself a number from what, ten is the best day of your life, one is the worst day of your life, and you can do halves. Whatever that number is, that's why this exercise is just for you. You're not sharing it with me or anybody. 
Put that number in the upper left-hand corner after you flip that card over and circle it. No talking. Okay, so now you've got that, and again, occasionally I would do polls in different places, and who's a five or this, and I'm not going to do any of that kind of thing, because I don't want to, if you're having a bad day, we don't want to share that with anybody. If you're having a great day, that's fine, but this is, again, for you, yourself, and I, the three of you. So you got that number in the upper left-hand corner. Now here's what I want you to do. In the center of that card, you're going to write three things. Number one, what is the thing you're most grateful for? Just write that down. And again, I always try to gauge how fast people are. You can write a name, you can write a sentence, you can write a couple of things, whatever it is. And then put number two, and that is the second thing you are most grateful for. Number one, I'm assuming, is the most important, and number two, second most important. And lastly, number three, again, it's about 10.30 or thereabouts, so maybe yesterday. What was the highlight of your day yesterday? What was the best thing that happened to you yesterday? I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to think about this, because you wanted, what's the best thing that happened to you yesterday? Okay, now, hopefully you've all done that. I just want you to reread very carefully number one, number two, and number three, and just think about those two things you're most grateful for and the highlight of your day yesterday. And after reading those things and thinking about it, that's why I don't like people sharing, this is just you and yourself. I want to see if anybody's mind has shifted a little bit. Think about what number you might be now, whatever that number is, put that in the upper right-hand corner and circle it. Okay, by show of hands, how many people's numbers stayed the same? Okay. By show of hands, how many people's number went up? About half and half. So I did a talk at this um, senior center. I've stopped saying this. I said, how many people's number went down? Because nobody ever raised their hand. The other day, somebody raised their hand. I went, I quit. I'm going to go back to Lowe's. You actually wrote what you were grateful for and your number went down? God, well, you're not a very good speaker. Thank you. Once again, now that's a card that you can hang on to. On the front, you've got how somebody sees you. Because I think we're so very, very tough on ourselves and it's neat to see how somebody sees you as in such a positive light. And on the back, you've got the thing you're most grateful for, the second thing, and maybe the highlight of that particular day, which was yesterday. But that's how easily a mind shift to gratitude can make a difference. I've been a speaker for about two and a half, three years now. It was only about a year ago I started telling this story. Because it kind of um, is worse than losing my wife. So my mother died of cancer. But before that, she was bipolar. She would call me when I was going to high school and to college on the phone and she would take a bottle of pills and she would shake them in the phone. I could hear them just like that. I was going to the University of Washington or Queen Anne High School. You either come over to the house right now or I will eat all these pills and before you, by the time you get here, I'll be dead. She did a lot. I have three brothers and a sister. And I always thought, what if I don't get over there? 
Robbie or Jimmy or Donnie or Gina is going to go, thanks David, mom's dead now, thanks to you. But she was uh, manic depressive, now called bipolar. So I'd always go over there. I didn't want to take that risk. At some point she finally got some drugs, lithium and some different things that helped her. But it was a really, really tough, manipulative thing to do to a person like me. That if she had done that, now she's going to be dead. Well, the reason I bring up that story is because I got that from her. And when you lose a wife to Vicodin and Oxycontin, other friends to all these other booze and pills and drugs and coke and crack and dope and everything, I think those are ways that people try to cope. But a lot of them kill you. So I thought, I don't think I can do the pill thing. About a year and a half ago, I'm giving a talk. I wake up about 8 o'clock and I, on those numbers, I'm not going to ask anybody for your numbers. Hopefully there's a lot of 7s, 8s, 9s that were out there. Maybe somebody went from a 7 to an 8, 8 to 9, what have you. I was a 2, probably a 1. I didn't get it. I thought, I just don't get this life and I don't appreciate what my mother gave me. But I just can't go that route because of what happened to Dana. Just couldn't. So I said, well, Mr. Gratitude Guy, I guess you better practice what you preach. So I got my little gratitude journal and I went to Starbucks and I wrote in it for about five, six minutes. That probably took me to about a four or a five. I had a talk that day up in Burlington, Burlington Chamber of Commerce. Loaded up my books and everything and got in my car, drove up there. About 200 people, it was a nice sized group. Still only about a four or five. So I'm done. I had a little table, kind of like out there, some books, people come over and they want to talk to you, it's very gratifying. Lady comes up to me, she's crying. Can I give you a hug? I said, sure. Gives me a hug. She goes, you just changed my life. I went, really? Tears coming down her eyes and everything. Cheeks, I should say. So what happened? So she kind of tells me, my son, suicide, drugs, husband, alcohol, I'm just, a lot of things we all hear a lot of, unfortunately. But your talk, and particularly your story about this, it made a big difference to me. She said, I want to get a gratitude journal and some other things. But I gave her another hug and said thank you and walked out to my car. I sat in my car for about five minutes. And I realized now I was a nine. I hadn't had a bottle of beer. I hadn't had any Coke, any dope, any cigarettes, anything else. I just wrote my gratitude journal in the morning and helped somebody change their life. And as I look at you fine young men and women as perfect examples of this, are you not out helping other people with what you do, with your service? If you want to help yourself, help other people. That's how I've managed to help myself through this unfortunate affliction that my mother gave to me. She gave me a lot of good things. That's not something I appreciated, but it's been a very, very tough challenge. I get to speak at Rotary's a lot. Rotary's motto is service above self. So when you think again back to your service, and when you get to go out and help people, whether it's in our country or in a foreign land, whatever, you're helping other people. And yes, it's tough, and yes, people die, and yes, things happen that are bad, but I don't know if there's a better feeling in the world than knowing that you help somebody. I was talking to somebody one day, and they said, you know, I think the situation is people are all looking for this. So I got one of these. I didn't realize they actually talk. I just thought it was plastic. And so I can just see somebody. Well, here's the thing, Dave, Mr. Brook. You know why I get to use dope to deal with everything I have? Why? That was easy. I think people think it's easy. Same thing, it could be anything, it could be a beer. That was easy. I thought this was so cool. The problem is, all these ways, we're all looking for coping mechanisms. We're all looking for tools in the toolkit. And I talk about a gratitude journal. Now, do you think everybody in this room is going to get a gratitude journal or get the idea? Of course not. But as I said, if one person does or a couple of people do, it was worth it to me. 
And again, as a coping mechanism, it's a tool in the toolkit. And my attitude is, when I spend that five minutes every day writing in that, that was easy. It takes five minutes. So I think a lot of people, you can't blame them. A good buddy of mine told me about, I said, why do you think drugs are such a problem? I've asked people that forever. Never got a good answer until about a year ago. To a psychiatrist, psychologist. Because I think drugs are a problem because people just don't want to feel bad. That may be the best answer I've ever heard of. How can you blame a person for wanting to feel bad? Take this, do that, do whatever. It's killed a lot of people. As I mentioned, my dad committed suicide, and Dana did an overdose, have lost friends, they fried their livers, their brains, their bodies, everything. And I think maybe they just want to feel bad. Again, is a gratitude journal the ultimate thing? No, but it's another tool in a toolkit. And when you get to have a tool in a toolkit, these tools might work differently for him, for her, for whoever, but it can make a difference. And that's what I try to tell people. The most important relationship you'll ever have in your entire life is with yourself. When you look at your life, no matter how young you find folks are, how long you've been on the planet, you may notice that some of the best decisions you ever made in your life were when you felt the best about yourself. And conversely, when you made tough decisions or bad decisions, maybe you didn't feel as good about yourself. But it tends to work that way. That relationship that you have with yourself is so important that I find that ultimately, I think people that have a great relationship with themselves find out what they're passionate about, will probably find their purpose. Relationship with yourself. So let's look at Andrew Jackson. If I went down, and just any of you and just gave, how many people would want this $20 bill if I gave it to you? I always wonder about the ones like, you didn't raise your hand, don't want it? I know, he goes, don't pick on me, I'm only in the third row. I would, wouldn't most people want this if I just gave it to you? Thank you. Love that guy right there. So if I do this, how many people still want it? Thank you, that's much better participation. If I do this, and stomp on it, and crush it, and all that kind of stuff, pick it up and smooth it out, how many still want it now? That's even better. Now you guys are great. And lastly, if I look at Andrew Jackson, I say, Andrew, you're a piece of crap. You're worthless. I'm not even sure why you're on this earth, frankly. You know what Andrew Jackson does? He looks back at me and goes, well, that's just super, Mr. Speaker, but I'm still worth 20 bucks. I'm still worth the full 20 bucks. So why is it those of us that look in the mirror will let somebody crush you, step on you, or tell you you're worthless or don't deserve to be on this planet and somehow are now worth less than 20 bucks. 10 bucks, five bucks, or worse yet, zero. Doesn't bother Andrew Jackson. We think a lot about, back to that thing, we say things to ourselves we'd never say to a friend. When I mentioned that earlier, that relationship that you have is so critical. When I did that one to 10 exercise, I'm not going to, you can tell me your number later if you want, but you don't have to. But that'll tell you just by having a little different mindset how your mind can shift to seeing what you're grateful for and maybe go from a 7 to an 8 or an 8 to a 9. And if anybody wonders about that relationship you have with yourself, how important it is, they, well, I, I appreciate other people more than me and I'm kind of a giver and I'm loyal to a fault and I'm all these different things. That's fine. But I will tell you, I noticed something in Reno about a year ago. I went with a buddy of mine. We were playing blackjack and craps and different things. He was on the slot machine. He goes, Dave! And I hear him and he's yelling. He's over the side and I can hear all the coins falling. So he's won like $1,000. He put like a quarter in this thing. And it's back when the old coins were still going. So all the coins are like falling down and everything. He goes, Isn't this great? And he's like high-fiving me. And I go, yeah, you're buying dinner. And it just keeps coming. It's just, he put like 50 cents in. $1,000. And I looked at him and I looked at the machine and I went, you know, I'm so happy for him. I am so happy for him. But I'd be just a little happier if that was me. Do you guys disagree? No? 
I mean, it's just, that's the point I was trying, I mean, it's happy, but wouldn't you have been nicer if you had the thousand dollars? So, that's that relationship you have with yourself. Next, if you can find your purpose, How many have ever seen the Steve Jobs commencement speech? Anybody? I would advise you to take a look at it. I saw a couple of hands. 2005, he did a commencement speech for um, Stanford University. Five minutes on uh, growing up, five minutes on Apple, and then five minutes on dying and dealing with cancer, which he had beaten at the time, but then later, uh, unfortunately, passed away from. My favorite part in the middle of that story in that video is you can connect the dots backwards but not forwards. So when you look back on your life and you can see why things happen, it makes such a difference. And one of the things he talked about is the worst day of his life was the day he got fired from Apple. John Scully came in from, I think it was Pepsi or something. And he was there and he, um, fired, off, he fired Jobs. And Jobs says, well, you know, I started the company. I started with uh, Steve Wozniak. I get fired. Ten years later, he does a bunch of other things, Pixar, and he does the iPhones and these various things he did or started planning those. And he comes back to the company and builds it the most valuable company in the world. But he wasn't able to see that until he looked back on it. So I think it's really important to find something you're passionate about. So I want to give you guys two minutes. I want you to go back to your partners, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to spend about a minute or two and talk to the other person and tell them, what are you most passionate about in this world? I don't care what it is. Two minutes, go. And just share it with your partners you had before. Okay, and stop. So anybody want to share any passion they have? 
That's a surprise. Anybody? Passionate? Anything you're passionate about? You. Hold on, let me be Phil Dunham. None of you guys will know who he is. Take the mic. You can take the mic. Actually, you're never supposed to do that. Go ahead. And my passion is that when I study international relationship and about that, and his passion is more snowboarding. Cool. Cool. You're a snowboarder? Where's Mr. Gratitude Journal? You answered that question earlier. What's yours? Uh, right now, it's uh, focusing on my family. I've been gone. Oh, cool. for, I just came back from a year, so oh, cool. I gotta fix some stuff and just you know, I'm passionate about spending time with my kids. Glad you got the journal. That's good. You promise you're right now. Yes, sir. <laughs> Anybody else that they're passionate about? Want to talk about? I was like when people like this is like when I was in math class and the guy who has the answer and I'm looking down. Nobody, nobody makes eye contact with you. Where was that? Whoa! That was you fishing all day. Hold on, we got to get you the mic. We we have to have that. We have to be able to hear this. Oh man, I'll never get through there. Thank you. Okay, have it for everybody. All right. So just so you guys know, if you ever need a chance, want to get out, get some fish, come talk to me. I will teach you how to fish. That is my passion. I love to be out on the water. I love to catch fish. That is what I do. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm not saying this, but that guy got more applause than anything I've said. That's a... Anybody else passionate? No? <laughs> you, guys, you guys know that they've done surveys that... Uh, People would rather run through a mall naked than speak in front of a group. Do you guys know that? That's one of the classics. Is it Mike? It's Mike, sir. What are you passionate about, Mike? Um, you said say I'm passionate about all the people in my life. I got lots of them, and I love them all. Cool. Anybody else? <laughs> Look at all the hands. <laughs> Look at all the hands going up. So I'm having lunch with a buddy of mine like six months ago. He takes out a little piece of paper about the size of one of those cards. He writes on it, we're talking about passion, fishing, snowboarding, family, whatever it might be. And he said, uh, I want to do something here. And he puts my name, David Brook. He writes $1 million. And he signs his name on it. He goes, here, I can make this good. And he hands it to me. We're at Salty's in West Seattle. And as I'm starting to take it, he goes, oh, one second before I give you that. If you cash that, you have to stop being the gratitude guy today. Would you do it? <laughs> you know, it's disturbing me that there's more laughs coming from the audience than from the stage. I told him no. I said no. I, 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 I get to do this two or three times a week. It's the best thing I've ever done. I've done a lot of crazy stuff in my life. It's the best thing I've ever done. When you get to alter somebody's life, change a life, impact a life, transform a life, any of those things. And he goes, well, that's great because it sounds like you found your passion. If you can end up taking fishing or your family or anything else that you can turn it into something you're not only passionate about but also gives you a way to make a living, you may have the ultimate, ultimate situation. I feel if you find yourself, really get in touch with that person, if you find your passion, I think you'll find your purpose. I think a lot of people in life never really, really find their purpose. I will tell you something, I used to memorize these, but I thought this was so instructive. I'm guessing the average age in here is probably 20s, early, mid-20s, something along that line. I always think it's interesting. What's that, Mike? The five regrets of the dying. I thought this was really interesting. If you want to go back and look, connecting the dots backwards, as Steve Jobs talked about doing, this was done with a bunch of people in nursing homes. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself rather than what everybody thought for me. I thought that was really cool. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I know a lot of people that have worked themselves literally to death. I wish I had expressed my feelings. Again, a lot of people tend to stuff them in favor of everybody else who's trying to tell them how to run their life. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And lastly, 
kind of in the spirit of John Lennon, I wish I'd let myself be happier. I feel so strongly about the whole happiness thing. One of the books I've done is called Happiness Starts with Gratitude. I don't know if you can truly be happy, in my opinion, unless you're grateful. Again, there's a lot of choices. My father, I'm a relatively, if not pretty, positive guy, even though I've gone through a lot of bad stuff. The most negative guy I ever met was my own father. He made a, just an absolute effort every day. I'd say, good morning, Dad. And he goes, what's good about it? It was just amazing, but it was a choice. It goes back to having a choice. The self-talk thing is a huge, huge thing. How you talk to yourself. If you look at those numbers that you gave yourself, 1 to 10, hopefully a lot of you are a 7 or 8 or 9, how do you stay a 7, 8 or 9? If you're a 7, how do you become a 9? If you become a 9, how do you become a 10 and so forth? A lot of it's the self-talk. Self-talk can lead us down the path to a good relationship with the person in the mirror. Which I'm convinced, again, whether it's drugs, whether it's suicide, whether a lot of the people that I've lost somehow lost that relationship with the person in the mirror. And a lot of people can help you, but in my experience, the person who can help you the most is you. There's a gal, I do this when I have groups, a lot of groups are 70 or 80, and they get a book, and so I collect business cards. And By the way, on the business card that you have, there's a QR code on there, and the reason I give those to people you hit that QR code, it takes you to the website, and you can, do, you can look at videos there, you can order a book, or you can get my little two-minute video I send out every Monday, just a little two-minute inspiration video, so that's why I wanted you to have those, real simple. But I give out a book, and I collect business cards, and so there's maybe 50 people, and so this, this gal, she gets the, yay, Sally, and she comes running up here, and she comes up to the stage, and she gets her book, and they're, oh, good going job, or good job, Sally. And she says to me, I always win. I always win. I just thought that was the best self-talk. She goes, yeah, my girlfriends hate me. And I said, well, you always, she goes, yeah, I always win. Well, I'm not sure that she always wins, but think about the difference between that when you go to the casino over here to say I always win versus why should I go, I always lose. And so it's a, a way you talk to yourself. Everything we do in our life starts with a thought in our brain. And the way you talk to yourself becomes such a direction that your life will go. I also don't take myself too seriously. Another time, lady, the gal wins the book. She comes up front. I give her the book. She goes, thanks. They're all clapping. And I said, you know, she turns to walk away. I said, you know, later, if you'd like, I'll sign that book for you. She looks at me and goes, that's okay. <laughs> I just went, whatever. That's fine. One of the last things I want to talk about, not only the self-confidence and the self-talk, but also, learn to listen. I make a point of really listening. This doesn't have as much to do with gratitude, but the reason why I think it's important when it comes to self-esteem and suicide and pills and people that are not happy in this world is you know what I think a lot of people want? Somebody just to listen to them. And maybe more than being a good listener is just be heard. I tell people when I do little college things that we do a listening section, I said the three most important words you can master or tell me more. There's a story about two guys that get on an airplane and they fly from New York to LA. One guy talks the entire way. The entire way. Never stops. So they get off, the wives pick him up, and the guy that talked the whole way, his wife says, how was your trip? He goes, oh, I met the nicest guy. You know why he was nice? Because he listened the whole time. Johnny Carson used to be on late night TV for many years when I was growing up. And if you ever look back at those old tapes, he never talked about himself. Always cared about the guests and asked them nothing but questions. So I think sometimes when people are talking to you, if we even do a better job listening, remembering names is another one that's very important to do. It makes such a better relationship. I've noticed this all the time. I'm sitting here with a friend. Guy comes up, looks at my friend. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Joe says, I just got back from Hawaii. Nine times out of ten, you know what this guy does? Well, that's so interesting. The last time I was in Hawaii, here's what we did. We went surfing, went scuba diving, went snorkeling. Went, and this guy starts talking about himself. And I've actually looked at people and said, hang on just a second. We're not talking about you. God, why did you make it about you? When you pay attention to people, you have some of the best friends you can ever have. Sharing gratitude. How many people have been on their smartphone since I've been talking? Just 
three honest people. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Everybody take out your smartphones. I don't, don't act like you don't have them. I've seen most of you guys coming in. If you don't have one, that's okay. I imagine there's a few. I imagine the majority of you do. I said earlier, if you want to help yourself, help other people. Service above self. You're in the service business, service people, whether it's rotary or fine military people or who have you, what have you. So here's what I'd like you to do. This is called text, tweet, telephone, or tell. I'm imagining most of you will text. I'm going to give you one minute. I want you to text, tweet, telephone, or tell somebody in your world on this device. And if you don't have it, just make a little note and tell them later how grateful you are to have them in your life. Go. Okay, and stop. Of course, you could do more. I try to learn to adjust my audiences. This is a pretty young audience, so I give people 60 seconds, and most people knock out about a text or two. I go to the high schools, and they show me like seven texts in like 60 seconds. Their fingers are just flying. But it's always fun to see what people say. The vast majority of people text. Occasionally, somebody said, I don't have my phone with me. You can make a note and hand that to the person. You can telephone them. These things actually work as telephones. I'm in a high school. It was actually it was a high school uh, auditorium with the seats going up like this, and a young lady was over there. She probably, I don't know, 50s or something. But I could hear her. She was on the telephone. She's going like, yeah, hi, honey. I just, I really, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's her husband. I'm so grateful for you. I just love you so much, and I so appreciate you, and I just wanted you to know that, I don't know, some speaker just told me to call you and tell you this. I don't know. <laughs> That's not the idea. So then people, when it's a big group or a small group, they'll stop up on the way out. I always like people to say hi and if they want to buy a book or journal or say hello, that's great. So they show you their phones. And then I get things like, uh, look at this one. that says, I'm grateful for you too. What do you want? <laughs> and I start getting them from the audience. That's what all cracks me up, right in the middle. Who's, what's, which phone number is that? And then another one recently was, uh, she proudly walks up to me and points it to me and she goes, are you sure you sent this to the right person? <laughs> the reason why sharing gratitude is such an important thing is because it goes back to if you want to help yourself, help other people. I cannot emphasize that enough. I shared with you earlier something I haven't shared when I started this journey, which is this bipolar, manic, depressive junk that I was put upon. Feels like rocks crushing me in a frickin' landslide on I-90. I don't, I used to not talk about it. Well, I had a lot of options, but one of the best ones I've ever learned is to go out and help people. 
I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychiatrist, I don't have any recommendations on things, I will just tell you it's helped me. When you get to share something, it makes it so much more fulfilling. As I mentioned, I happen to be a person who never drank or smoked or did drugs, it just wasn't my journey. Everybody's journey is individual, as I've said. But I did a lot of crazy daredevil stuff. I learned how to fly, I raced a hydroplane, I jumped out of airplanes, bungee jumped, did all that kind of crazy stuff, raced go-karts, I just wanted to do adrenaline stuff. So when I'm back in college, these same fraternity brothers that I reference occasionally that apparently weren't impressed by my presentation, said, let's go skydiving. I'll take care of it, I'll make the reservation. So I make reservations for 10. Way back to Issaquah skydiving, back in Issaquah, Washington. So on Monday, I make the reservations on Saturday for the following Saturday. So on Monday, I get a call from a couple of them. <coughs> I think I have a sore throat. And then a couple of them got a cold. And then on Wednesday, um, yeah, my big toe hurts. So I get to Saturday at 10 o'clock. I walk up to the counter at Issaquah skydiving like this. And he goes, can I help you? And I went, hi, um, I have reservations for Brooke for 10. He looks over my shoulder and he goes, well, where are all your friends? And I looked at him and I said, I don't have any. Nobody showed up. I don't use PowerPoint. I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint. I like to look at people, watch people's eyes, notice who's paying attention, who's falling asleep. It happens everywhere. But I've been to a lot of PDF places, or PDF presentations rather, where they just read what's on the screen, so I don't typically do that. But I did put up a picture in a church, shows me skydiving all by myself. And I'm like all scared, my little face looks like I'm grimacing because so I'm going to die. But I didn't get to share that with anybody. It's always bothered me. Because so when you get a chance to do something and share it, personally or professionally, it makes it so much more fulfilling. As I mentioned, I flew a lot fly occasionally, but not as much back when I was you guys' age. I got caught in two layers of clouds down in ocean shores. And I was a VFR pilot, which means visual flight rules, not in the weather. And I needed to get out in a hurry. And all of a sudden, the sun comes in from the coast and starts hitting these clouds and it looks like a kaleidoscope. For those of you that are old enough, which aren't going to be very many, there was a scene in 2001 where all these colors are coming out, the space odyssey. And it was just unbelievable. I'm going along at about 200 knots and the colors are going above and below me. It's the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. And as soon as I'd gotten into it, it seemed like a minute or two had passed and bam, I'm out of it. And I'm out by the sand and I can see the ocean and ocean shores and so forth. And I turn to my right and I go, isn't that the most incredible? Did you see the blues and the silvers and the reds and the yellows and that kind of thing? And I went, oh, I'm flying by myself. I was by myself. So nobody got to share that. So when you find something that you can share with people, it makes it so much more fulfilling. One, two, three, four, five, six. Can you guys come up on stage? Good job on the applause. So before I wrap up here in a few minutes, I want to make a little point about Come on over here, please, and just sort of stand shoulder to shoulder. I'm only going to do six people. Thank you all for volunteering, I know. Boy, if looks could kill, sometimes they look at you like, why did I sit in the front row? So, we're just going to see how good of listeners you guys are, and they're going to represent you guys, the six. So, Mr. Neal, yes. will you just take a look at that? This is something, we're selling something. Up, oh, look straight ahead. Just, you, you got it? Okay. Then you're going to tell, actually, get about six inches apart, just so we have a little, so you don't, okay, perfect. Now you tell him what's for sale, and then we'll go down, all the way down to the list, to Mr. Wakeham. Wakeham? Go on in. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, wait, time out, time out, time out. Now, did you get, you got all the stuff on here? Oh, yeah, no, sorry, yeah. Oh. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> that was a little too fast for me. We're selling something. We just want to say, there's a few details. Sorry.
So, uh, it's Wacom. Okay. What, what were we? Uh, what are we selling? Uh, 1990s Thunderbird with 70,000 miles on it for sale. So, I have a lot of confidence in you folks. So, Mr. Neal, right, was told a 1994 Thunderbird Navy Blue automatic transmission, turbocharged engine, 73,000 miles, tinted windows, $4,500. And you know what Mr. Wakeham got? Did you not get a 1990 Thunderbird with, with 70,000 miles? This is phenomenal. Can you just give him a round of applause? I am not. You guys can take off. You guys can head back. You guys think, you guys think I'm joking? I've gone to so many places where we've done that with six or eight people. You know what they come up with? Uh, a red schoolhouse is getting repainted in Pennsylvania. I am not kidding you. So to know that was a 90 Thunderbird with 70,000 miles is tremendous. I don't care if it's 60 people. So there's six people. I got tremendous president. So thank you so much for listening today. I appreciate so much what you do for us as citizens of the United States. I don't think we appreciate it. I don't think we show enough gratitude for that. So I am so grateful to all of you for doing what you do as well as being here today. I would ask if you remember anything I say, embracing gratitude can completely change and transform your life. If you take the attitude of it takes as long as it takes and don't ever give up, Winston Churchill, that will serve you well. If you get rid of the crud in your brain, don't let your friends or families or people that you know tell you what you should do with your life. It's going to be the relationship you have with yourself that will be so valuable, and especially when it comes to getting rid of junk. Don't let somebody else devalue you like Andrew Jackson does not on that $20 bill. I highly recommend the Gratitude Journal. It takes five minutes a day. You can get them from me out there. You can get them on the website. I would ask you to take a good look at yourself and really get a great relationship with you. Figure out at some point what your purpose is, and I think you'll probably find, or your passion rather, I think you'll probably find what your purpose is. And finally, lastly, when you find something you're really passionate about, share it with other people. There's no better feeling to have somebody tell you you've changed or transformed their life. I get told that a lot. I feel very, very fortunate. Gratitude changed my life, transformed my life. And truthfully, I can look at every one of you and tell you this from the bottom of my heart. Without gratitude, I would not be here today. I believe it saved my life. I truly believe it did by having that attitude. And it can save yours too. Thanks a lot.